We're so happy to have you here today for our kickoff of our Vetrepreneur Launch Program. So we are all about honoring veterans and veteran spouses and veteran dependents and organizations that help veterans. So if you are a veteran or connected with a veteran, why don't you raise your hand? Ow! Yeah. <laughs> And we have a lot of business students here as well who are learning the ropes about how they can also support you. Let's see your hands up. Uh-huh. <laughs> so with that, uh, I would like to kick off our event and with great honor introduce you to our president and superintendent of Santa Barbara City College, Dr. Anthony Beebe. Dr. Beebe has served as both instructor and administrator during his 20, 30 years in higher education. And as former uh, president of San Diego, San Diego City College, Dr. Beebe was recognized as the people's president for his community work and service. Dr. Beebe's other previous positions include eight years as president of San Diego Continuing Education, Vice President of Instruction and Student Services for Yakima Valley Community College in Washington, Associate Vice President of Instruction for Workforce Development at Mount Hood Community College in Oregon, and in the late 1990s, Dr. Beebe directed the Community Education Program at Riverside Community College and was the founding dean of Open Campus. Earlier in his academic career, Dr. Beebe taught business and management, and he also served as a full-time paid firefighter and a training officer in an army base in Saudi Arabia. Please give a warm welcome for Dr. Anthony Beebe. Well, thank you, Julie, and I gotta say that of all those things, the thing that I was most proud of was working in Saudi Arabia on that military base, um, serving the folks that were there. So I wanna welcome you too uh, to this launch of our SBCC Vetrepreneur Program, which is really serving and honoring the veterans uh, that we have in the region. And, you know, I know that Julie Nadell, and she's going to come up and talk a little bit, but one of the things that, that she's always said and she's talked to me about is how we do so much better when we do things together. And this is really a collaboration between the Jack and Julie Nadell School of Business and Entrepreneurship, the SBCC and UCSB um, Veterans and Military S Centers that we have, and the regional small business development centers that we have. And by having those, those partners involved with this, we really are gonna be able to do something spectacular. And I'm looking for this to be the model for the country. We're gonna get it started here, but this is gonna be the model going forward for the country. So this is just absolutely fantastic. And it's all due to the very generous uh, donations that um, Julie Nadell has given to us at the college and for us here. So we need to recognize her and give her a big round of applause, please. <laughs> of course, it's in honor of Jack Nadell, who was a, a World War II veteran. He was an entrepreneur. He was a global business leader and an author. And if you haven't had a chance to read his books, Make sure you get them because they really are inspirational. We also have some fantastic videos that have been put together on Jack Nadell that really give you an idea of this, this man's character, his spirit, um, what he's all about, and I think that it, it's really worth your time to, to spend some time watching those, those videos. Just a bit about Jack. Um, he was an award-winning entrepreneur, which is why we're, we're calling him a veteranpreneur because he was a veteran and an entrepreneur. And he founded, acquired, and operated more than a dozen small businesses. Produced hundreds of jobs and products. Actually, thousands of, thousands of jobs, if, what, if I remember right. Thousands of jobs overall, and really produced millions of dollars worth of profits um, for the region. 
His trademark company and legacy, the Jack Nadell International, lives on today and is, is a global leader specializing in advertising and marketing uh, of different products. But Jack's career really spanned seven decades. So he, he was around a long time and he, he contributed a, a lot over those, those decades. And he was very generous in his time. He liked to, to mentor uh, individuals and, and up and comers. And he was very, very generous in terms of, of giving back to the community in terms of his philanthropy. And he, he did that by um, making direct donations to organizations and individuals, but also through the development and operation of the Nadell Foundation, which again lives on and now is, is run by, by Julie, in, <laughs> among all the other things that she does. Um, of course, Julie is here today, and I want to say a little bit about her. She is she's an accomplished entrepreneur herself and um, an award-winning um, business owner. She started out in the catering business, and I, I know she's going to talk a little bit about this, but um, catering business and an, an event planning uh, business. And she's also been a, a motivational speaker, talking with folks about starting businesses and, and those kinds of things but really giving people a philosophy of life. It's more than just running a business. Um, and, and I've really gotten to know her, and I, I respect her so much. Um, she's just been amazing. But she's now carrying on the, the, the mission of, of uh, her late husband, Jack Nadell, um, in helping uh, entrepreneurs grow and, and get started in, this, in their business or whatever passion that might be. Um, and so we're so grateful for her and her great donation to the, to the business program that we have. Um, just to mention a few of her accolades, in 2012, Julie was named Volunteer of the Year for the entire county of Santa Barbara. Yeah, that's a big deal. Give it up for her, yes. In 2014, uh, First District Supervisor Doss Williams awarded Julie a certificate of recognition along with Pacific Coast Business Times for her distinguished championship in health in healthcare, and she's been a big supporter of that. Julie has been a featured speaker in many catering events and industry conferences, healthcare conferences, uh, philanthropic kinds of events, of course, entrepreneurship kinds of things, and uh, I, I'm just so proud that she's she's uh, adopted us here at Santa Barbara City College and adopted all of you that are going to be involved with with this Vetrepreneur program. So it's my honor to introduce uh, our sponsor and fe featured speaker today, um, Julie Nadell. Give her a big welcome. Thank you. Anthony, you were too nice. <laughs> I, I'm so grateful for this journey that we've had together because I've had the opportunity to get to know you better, and it is a privilege. And you are the people's president, and I really love that. And it's something that I think our community, and Santa Barbara City College in particular, is very fortunate to have. Now, <clears throat> you took a lot of my lines, so some of them now I'm going to have to modify. <laughs> For our military guests in attendance today, Thank you for your service. And for the spouses and families of those service members, we recognize and we're grateful for your sacrifices and commitments. There's a lady here in the audience that, that I know. She, she, her husband was a military man. She moved 20 times, 20 times. That's a lot. And without the support of the spouses, I, I don't know how you guys would and gals would make it. It's really, it's a way for you to achieve your personal best. The event today is a combined effort with SBCC and UCSB's Veterans Department, a perfect example of Aristotle's famous axiom, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Just look around here and know how we have succeeded. Special shout out to Corey Dillard, from UCSB and Kyle, as Corey, I see. I don't see Kyle, but Kyle, wherever you are, there he is. 
Kyle Rasmussen from our Veterans Department here. They encourage their students to come today to join forces and learn about veterinarship. Bonnie, Bonnie Chavez, Professor of Business Administration and Department Chair, Real Estate and Entrepreneurship, right? Pretty good there, I got it. You're always helping sharing new ideas with your students. You're always in our corner. You're always promoting genuine leadership and community outreach. You're an invaluable resource and a champion for Santa Barbara City College. Jack would have been really proud of this gathering today. It always takes a village to put on these kinds of events together. There's been a great committee working on this. Special thanks to all of you, but I am going to single out two people. In particular, these two women gave it their all. Carola Smith, Acting Dean of Educational Programs, and Julie Sampson, Director of the Scheinfeld Center. Julie, you worked tirelessly to spread the word, obtain our incredible keynote speaker, fill the room with military and aligned people, people that will really benefit from this conversation today. And you do it all with such style. You're awesome, really awesome. I think you deserve a little. I feel really lucky to have made friends with the two of you and to observe what you do to improve the quality of education at Santa Barbara City College. So I had a show of hands, too. You took that away from me there. <laughs> but I'm going to say it anyhow. Show of hands. If you could pursue your dream as an entrepreneur, would you? That's what I like to see. What is holding you back? Are you afraid of money to finance your business? Are you afraid of failure? Maybe you're afraid of success. In order to share my story, I have to give you some context. Jack was a widower, and I was a divorcee when we met in 2002. So the stories I'm going to share with you are from our former lives. We had independently found entrepreneurship our passion. And we met, when we met and married, we used those skills in our philanthropic efforts in Santa Barbara. We stayed local to improve the quality of life for our special community here. When Jack left the Army Air Corps, now the Air Force, as a decorated officer in 1945, after flying 27 missions over Japan in a B-29, his dream was to be his own boss, start a company, and become an entrepreneur. He was broke. Can you relate to that? <laughs> Along with his brother, who survived Pearl Harbor in the Special Forces, he went to the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce to inquire about business opportunities. They were told that a Chinese group were making inquiries about navy blue woolen material, tons of it. So they looked around and could find none. So Jack had an idea. This is where it works if you have these skills, if you're an opportunist and you have these kinds of entrepreneurial instincts. He went to army surplus stores and he bought as much olive drab woolen material that he could find. He dyed it navy blue and he sold it to the Chinese. Well, how did he finance the deal? He went to a bank and he got back-to-back -back letters of credit. No money up front and Jack Nadell International was born. That material was made into uniforms for Chiang Kai-shek's army. The first financial statement Jack ever read was his own. He had to figure it out. Here at SBCC, you have an opportunity to take business class, classes that address these issues. What an edge you have when you start a business armed with knowledge that you've received from educators, expert in this and other business arenas. Jack then went back to Japan in the 50s and started doing business with the Japanese. The different factories, he imported merchandise from Japan. 
That first trip back was quite weird and scary for him. Eventually, he became integrated into the Japanese business sector, and he even wrote a book, My Enemy, My Friend. In the early 80s, President Ronald Reagan asked Jack to go on a trade mission to Japan to improve business relationships and increase trade with the United States. Quite a 180, I would say, and that was a huge success. <clears throat> I'll tell you a quick story. One of his, uh, uh, in the vans they were traveling around with, one guy sitting next to him was the CEO of Winnebago. And he was complaining to Jack that the roads are so narrow in Japan that they're not selling Winnebago's. So Jack simply looked at him and said, make smaller Winnebago's, because they're not enlarging the roads for you. In my case, I was divorced with two daughters. One is sitting right here. You can raise your hand, Hillary. Three and eight years old. And I needed to forge a career to support them. I was working at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles doing their special events. And a board member asked me to plan a party for his company. 1,000 guests. I said yes, because I'm a little crazy. And my company, Parties Plus, was born. That was 1978. I had no money, no employees, nothing but good organizational skills, and I was a fine cook. I bought the food, hired the help with a deposit from the client, and used every ounce of ingenuity I could come up with to do a great job. I knew it was good when I saw the wives lining their husbands' pockets with napkins and putting the desserts in their soup pockets. <laughs> I did find the best people in the business to hire and help me execute the event, so I did meet with great success. I did that deposit thing for quite a while until I could qualify for a loan from the bank. It wasn't easy. I had no credibility. And in those days, the bank went with my doctor ex-husband, not me. But I persevered and kept doing events and building a reputation. Twelve years later, I was bought out by a public company. I, too, read my own financial statement as the first statement I had ever seen. Wouldn't it have been wonderful to have a business track in a community college to prepare me for the bumps that, that are inevitable? I would definitely have less wrinkles in my face today, I'll tell you that. Not everyone is cut out to become an entrepreneur. Larry will tell you that, I'm sure. Or in your case, a vetrepreneur. But you could become an intrapreneur. Working for commission under the umbrella of a big company and their infrastructure. You would get advances against your commissions, and it would be less stressful, although you must produce sales to succeed. That's the kind of company my husband established, and these journals and pens that you have today were ordered from his company. Under the advice from business schools such as ours, you will be able to find a career path that suits your skills and your comfort level. Jack always said, you do not have to learn anything new to be a success. Use what you have to get what you want. And this especially applies to those of you who have served in the military and learned the value of discipline and hard work. Here at the Nadell School of Business and Entrepreneurship, supporting veteran entrepreneurs is an utmost priority. And now I would like to welcome to our stage our business department chair, Bonnie Chavez, to join, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. To join Larry in the fireside chat. Lovely fire. Indeed. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm not sure if we should stand up and run around or sit here, but you made me want to stand up and run around. That's, That's how we should live our lives, shouldn't we? A little bit of energy. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, so many things to ask, and okay. I, we want to give an opportunity to all of you to also participate and ask questions of Larry. Uh, so I'm going to just kind of begin the conversation. Um, first of all, uh, to you and every other veteran in this room and to our dear friend, uh, 
Jack Nadell, who is here in spirit, I know today. Yeah. Uh, I am so honored to be in the presence of so many veterans who have served our country with dignity and honor. And it's a privilege to be here today with yeah, all of too. you. Thank you, Flaming. Yeah, yeah awesome. for sure. Thanks, everybody. Um, um, uh, you said so many things today that I'm, I feel reaffirmed by, and so thank you for that. Uh, one of the questions that I often get from a variety of students and veterans mm -hmm. uh, students is that they think success is for somebody else. Yeah. And that those who are successful, as we look at you today, a successful entrepreneur, it was almost like it was uh, a process that was destined, that you were yeah. kind of, that was supposed to be your life. Yeah, yeah. And, and so in, in your view, because you said something really important, what do you think are the qualities of people who are high achievers? It's a great uh, question, and um, it is one of the things that I'm kind of, um, People look at my life and they think it, I got it all together. There's actually a couple of people who know me and actually, have, I don't know where Brett is around here. I have fly, flown high. I have crashed and burned, scraped along the bottom, burned through a marriage, you know, burned through friendships, a lot of stuff in my wake. All right, and it's uh, miserable. I'm going to encourage people not to do, to do, to do that. So what are the qualities? Um, you got to be tenacious absolutely um, uh, tenacious. I think that if you have a servant heart and you're willing to serve people, when you, we went into the military, you put on the uniform and you really went into the what? What do they call it? You went into the service. It's that same trait, that same drive, that same characteristic, I think, uh, that, that helps folks out. Um, the other one is the willingness to be humble. Um, that's a big one. You know, you hear people talk about discipline and all that kind of stuff, but I think that uh, humility is a really good one. And knowing when to ask for help. Too many of us just, you know, we, we're afraid to ask for help for, for some reason. But I'm going to beg you, hire a coach, join a mastermind, find a mentor in your life. These are things I didn't do early enough on in my career. And um, all you need to do is find someone who's further down the path than you are uh, on, on this stuff. And, um, and just expect that there's going to be some sacrifice. You know, and the, the odds are stacked against you. So what? Do it anyway. It's okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we just got through this past week talking in my business classes uh -huh. about accounting. And a phrase that I shared with my students is something that my business partner or sister said to me many, many years yep. ago. And I'd, I'd like to hear your response to this. Uh-oh. Put me on the spot, students. <laughs> when when okay. we met with our accountant many times, uh -huh. Uh, only to see that we had lost money again and yeah. again and again. Yeah. He would always say, do you have any questions? And finally one time my sister said, I don't know what it is that I need to know, so I don't know what it is that I need to ask. Right. Right. What are the questions our veteran entrepreneurs should be asking today? And what is the, what are, I love the phrase because I use it all the time with my students. I want you to connect the dots. Yeah. What, what are the dots we should be paying attention to? Yeah, let me maybe answer it a different way. Um, one of the biggest mistakes ever made, no, that's not, let me phrase it differently. If I were to do things a little bit differently, I would have brought, it, brought on board an in-house accountant much sooner. I think it's one of the things, what, what happens? We don't hire an accountant soon enough, we don't hire a salesperson soon enough, and then, then when revenue starts to dip, what do we do? We cut sales and we cut out the accounting. <laughs> um, hello, wrong. Um, so what should they be asking? Well, I think an even better way to look at this uh, might be, um, why aren't I asking questions? I'm going to encourage everyone, if you get a board of advisors, not a board of directors, but have a board of advisors even before you launch your business, three, four, five people who have strengths and areas that you don't even, might not even know, like if you're a process person, get somebody who's got a great marketing background. If you're a marketing person, get someone who's got a great financial background and meet with them regularly and let them help you ask questions, okay? But there's a few things I think that we ought to be looking at, and sometimes we don't, we don't know this stuff, is num number one, profit doesn't really matter if you don't have cash. Cash flow is king, not profit, okay? And so many of us have been duped by some 
salesperson who comes in, hey, I got this product. If you just order 6,000 of them, I'm going to get you a 1% discount on it. And it's, great, but it's going to take 12 years to go through this stuff, and you got money sitting on your shelf, right? And you can't pay payroll, or you can't do your, you know, pay your, your rent. So, um, so anyway, I, a board of advisors is the big thing, and they can help you ask those questions that you're not even uh, aware of. Um, but um, a question I would always ask uh, my accountant early on is, what can I do to create more cash? Right? And there's a lot of ways to answer that. You know, drive revenue is one. Renegotiate contracts is two. Control your inventory is three. Don't let your um, uh, accounts receivable get too high. So we could go all day on, on this, but did I skirt it too much or did I no, touch on it? No, uh, that was perfect. Thank okay. you. I really appreciate that. Uh, leaning back now towards your military experience, uh -huh. what, what did you learn in the military that you think contributed to your success as an entrepreneur so that our vets here today can think about some of those attributes? Yeah, what did I learn uh, there? Um, I think, so I spent zero days in the conventional military. It was all in, in the special operations community. And so things are done a little bit differently there than in the conventional military. But I, I'll tell you this. Um, one of the things I learned, which is counter to how I, how I was before I went in, is to um, give trust first. Don't make people earn it. OK? It takes a long time. It's a hard road. I'll trust somebody until they give me reason not to. Um, I suspend judgment, and I would encourage veterans to do this. Suspend judgment um, on a problem or a challenge um, and just ask tons of questions. Too often, I see this in the military, um, right? Because our perspective from the battlefield is different if I stand here versus standing there, right? And so by asking tons of questions, we get to see a different perspective. So just because at first glance you see a challenge or an opportunity in business, ask tons of questions. Um, I've said this a few times, uh, a big thing in, in my life, as I've said over and over again, is tenacity. I've seen a lot of really super talented people, highly educated people who are losers, okay? Tenacity eats talent for lunch. I will take somebody who's tenacious any day of the week over somebody who's talented and who has a great resume. So those are some of the things that I, would, I learned. Uh, you know, I, I encourage students, uh, you said something about uh, being dyslexic and not a very good student, and, mm -hmm. and I think in part you kind of mirror some of the things that I like to share with students. I have students come in sometimes uh, and say, you know, I'm, I'm not a good writer, I'm not a good speller, yeah. I'm not good at math, and I, and I ask them, who told you that? Right. Who convinced you of that? That's right. And it becomes their self-fulfilling prophecy right. in a way, right? That's right. And, and, and so uh, for you, what was the key to overcoming those challenges, those learning challenges that you experienced early on yeah. to go on and have such great success yeah. at a yeah. school like Stanford? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so what I realized, I've got a very high IQ, um, and I didn't know that before. Just a really quick little thing. I'm sure some of you can, can relate to this. You know when you're like eighth or, or ninth grade and you go meet with your guidance counselor and they say, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to study? Um, so I went in, um, and I re remember it like it was uh, th this morning. And, I, and she said, so what do you want to do when, when you get out of high school? I said, I want to be a veterinarian. And she literally, I kid you not, laughed and said, honey, you're not smart enough to be a veterinarian. It was a guidance counselor. If you want to work with animals, you can go join FFA, Future Farmers of America, and work on a farm. Okay. So I walked out of there reinforced, you know, that I was an idiot, all right? Um, but um, I knew in my gut that I was smarter than grades allowed. If I hadn't taken the risk of going into special forces, um, and actually, by the way, when I took the ASVAB, I didn't do the little bubble thing. I actually tried to answer the questions. <laughs> it wasn't luck. Um, and um, I humbled myself finally. And I just, when I realized, hey, reading is important, I figured it out. I went and took classes for the, the one in four Americans have some form of dyslexia, all right? Um, I took classes while I was in the military on how to learn how to read, all right? And I just applied myself. Yeah, was it hard? Yeah. So when other guys are out drinking, I'm reading. I'm learning. I'm doing the stuff that other people won't do. Grind it out. 
If you take anything away from this talk, be tenacious. So um, you mentioned that you had businesses that failed and businesses that have been successful. Uh, I said failed miserably, I think is what I said. Okay, yeah. That's, okay, I, didn't, <laughs> I wanted to soften that blow a little bit. <laughs> You're so nice to me. <laughs> What was the difference between the business that failed miserably and the business that succeeded? Yeah, I talk about this in, in that uh, victory book of mine. Um, sometimes I started, you know, uh, reading my own press, how smart I was. And if I was successful here, why can't I be successful there? I didn't surround myself with people who were bolder and brighter than I was in that particular endeavor. Um, that was uh, one of the classic mistakes. I didn't do enough intel. So the word victory is ac actually an acrostic. So vision is the first letter, and that, the second one, yep. I is intel. Do tons of intel on business. Don't think that, what I should have done when I, these businesses that have failed, I should have worked in that business. I should have taken a J-O-B in that business if I had to, to learn that business, versus just stepping, oh, I'm smart, I can figure this out. No, I lost my shirt on a couple of those businesses where I just didn't do enough intel on it. Or hire people who are smarter than I am. You've heard this before, right? If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room, right? Know your strengths. I know my strengths now is building teams, building leadership people, because you know one of the you know, highest priorities of leaders is building other leaders. I can do that. I hire people who are smarter than I am now. Going into it, I let people know right away, I want you to be smarter than me. Absolutely. I, I love the concept, and you use the term, of servant leader or servant leadership. Yeah. Um, the challenge for many business owners, many managers, mm -hmm. is finding a team of people who are committed to the purpose. Yep. Uh, how often do you remind the, the te your team members in your organization of the purpose? Only um, daily. If you're a leader of an organization, you need to be the biggest evangelist. So every memo that goes out, I don't care whether I'm talking about something negative and bad. The bottom of it is something that speaks to our purpose. Mm -hmm. you so, you, so you asked the question of everybody earlier today, what, why they came today. What was their purpose? Uh -huh. What was your purpose? Yeah, that's a great question. So I carry in my pocket two things every day. And I, I showed you the poster earlier that said, um, um, it says more about you than you'd ever say about yourself. I'm a big believer in talisman. So in my pocket, I promise you, if I could reach in here right now, you'd find two things in my pocket. If I got hit by a bus, somebody could rummage through my pockets and pretty much tell who I am, right? Even if I didn't have any ID, they could tell who I am. One is my special forces coin. It talks about my hair. I'm getting emotional. Um, it talks about my heritage. Where am I from, okay? And the other is a small pewter globe. My purpose, I know for a fact where I'm in my life right now, is to make a positive impact on the world through leadership and entrepreneurship. That's my purpose. And everything I do in my life has to support that. If it doesn't support that, I throw it away. I don't go out bar hopping. I don't do a lot of stuff because I don't, I'm not fulfilled by it. Now, I know that part of my purpose is to be in restful, and so yes, I go ride horses, I take time off with my kids. You know, I'm not like a total workaholic, but if it's work-related, it has to be towards my purpose, and that's my purpose, mm -hmm. to make a positive impact on the world uh, through entrepreneurship and leadership. Well, I thank you for that. We appreciate you being here with us today. Yeah, thank you. What we're going to try to do now is maybe allow some of the audience members to ask you questions. Awesome. And if they don't, we can continue for a few more minutes. Great. So if anybody would like to ask a question, we're more than happy to uh, I think we have mics on the sides. So. Right? There are mics on both sides. And we would invite any questions that anybody might like to ask. Please, if you would. I have days where I have vision. I could see the invisible yeah. clearly yeah. right in front of me. Yep. And, and then I have days where it's gone. Yep. And I was wondering if you had any advice, techniques that you use. Yeah, dude, you, I'm with you. You know, sometimes it's just like a vapor, right? You just want to, if only I could, you, you think it's there. I, I thought I saw it there. You have to surround yourself with people who believe in you and who know it. This is why I'm a big believer in boards of advisors, okay? They will speak into you because they believe in you. They may not even care what your business is, but they believe in you and they believe in your vision so that when you are down in, are you a veteran? Okay. Do you have brothers and sisters around you who are willing to call you when you 
squirreled up in your apartment? Awesome. Those are the people. You give them permission that when I'm down, you speak into me. And you need to be in receive mode. I think the biggest problem we get is when you're in that space, and I'm, I get there too, is that somebody tries to encourage me, and I'm like, ugh, whatever. And you start that negative chatter in your head. What you need to do is bring it on. I'm in receive mode. Just bring it. Keep saying it. Keep saying it, okay? This is why I wrote this book, Flashpoints. You, my brother, need to get this book, all right? Because we get this negative chatter in our head, and I want you to think of your brain and your soul and your being like a big old tall glass of swamp water. Ugly, stinky, and I tell you, what's your name? Oli. Oli, you got to get that ugly, stinky swamp water out of there, but you can't pick it up and you can't tip it out. How are you going to do it? Heat it up. <laughs> Pour clean, fresh water into it, and you keep pouring it in, and ultimately it will displace the nasty stuff that's in there. It's a good visual on what you need to do to yourself. Every day, you need to be speaking positivity. You need to be speaking positivity into your life. You're the one responsible for it. When I crashed and burned, this is an important one. I'm sorry. i got to spend okay, a minute please. on it. Because I'll bet you, if you're asking it, I'll bet there. Anybody else have this concern, problem, challenge? Right. Um, I crashed and burned several years ago. Okay, brother? I mean, like, bad. 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 <laughs> Scraping along bottom losing everything, ready to end it. You're, you're reading me? And I had a mentor at the time who came and basically kicked in my door and as weird as this might sound, gave me a CD from Lewis Hay, or yeah, Lewis Hay, who has since passed away from Hay House Publishing. And it's called 101 Power Thoughts. And all it was, it's on YouTube, go listen to it. It's positive stuff. I just listened to it. He said, I don't want you listening to talk radio. I don't want you watching the news. If you are not in a meeting, you are listening to this, all right? And I just started retraining my brain with positive thoughts, all right? So the first thing you get up in the morning, I want you to start, I want you to get some positive affirmations in your brain. Last thing you do before you close your pretty little eyes at night is you write yourself a gratitude journal, everything that you're grateful for that day. Studies have shown you wake up and you sleep the way you go to sleep. If you're putting news in your brain, you're wa watching full metal jacket before you go to bed, guess where your brain is going to go? All right? This is a serious issue. You, I hope you're, you're, you're catching this. All right? So if you have people in your life who are speaking negatively in you, to you, don't go out in the deep waters. Stay in the shallow side. You're not. Who do you think you are? Exorcise them from your life. Sometimes those are like real loved ones, though. So manage your time with them, though. I'm not saying go get a divorce. But you need to figure something out. All right? You got to do the hard right over the easy wrong. The easy wrong is to stay right where you are. The hard right is making the tough decisions. I'm sorry to be preachy, but I'm telling you, I've lost too many friends because of this exact topic. I'm not, I'm not suggesting to anybody that he's about to end it all. But I mean, it, it does get that bad when you're in this entrepreneurial journey, right? It's lonely. It's hard. Right? So you, if you've got people that aren't being positive in your life, get them out of your life and get, replace them with somebody positive. So I'm sorry to preach, but it's really powerful. Okay? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Anybody else would like to ask a question? Hi, Debbie. Thanks for being here today. My pleasure. Um, my business partner is an ex-Marine JAG okay. um, polo player, and we're starting an equine therapy. I've got a great team of 10 excellent people. Um, we want to work with Wounded Ward. That's why she's not here today. She's teaching a warrior class. Okay. And so kind of I, I've got this great team of people, you know, just awesome. We're ready mm -hmm. for the next step. But it's hard to find out, like, okay, what's, you know, we all have our horses. We are all specially trained. But to get everybody together, I feel like, and I'm kind of, le you know, leading them all. But everybody is so busy, you know, because everybody still has to make a living. Is that a question? <laughs> what's my next step? What's your next step? Um, are you funded? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Um, yeah, her, so her point is that everyone is, is busy. Um, I hate to say this to you, 
but I love to say it to you, you might have the wrong team members then. If they don't have the same vision and they're willing to sacrifice the time that you do, listen, if you're starting a business and you're going out and watching movies uh, every night and you're sitting down and you're on Netflix or you're on Bumble and Tinder and you know, you're on Instagram and all that kind of stuff, you don't want it bad enough. Sorry, not sorry at all. This is the hard thing. This is why so many entrepreneurs, I want to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, I want this to happen. No, you don't. Until you're willing to grind it out and get two, three, maybe four hours of sleep some nights, you don't want it bad enough. If you're getting eight hours of sleep in the early days, God bless you, you're not moving fast enough. If you are not failing, you are not moving fast enough or getting close enough to your fullest potential. And every one of your team members need to feel the same thing. All right? And I'm sorry, but that's just that's the way it is. Now, I'm not saying that's the entire entrepreneurial career, right? But in the startup phase, when you're launching it, they ought to be obsessed with this. Do you agree or disagree? I completely agree. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. I think we got one here, and then you can go over here. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, one Hi. of the. Uh, I'm sorry. Remind me your name. My name's Hillary. I'm Julie. Hi, daughter. Hillary. Uh, one of the things I used to talk to Jack a lot about, and the the people who would come to him for mentorship, would suggest that there is less opportunity now than there was, let's say, in the 40s or 50s. Yeah. That so many businesses have been established, the market is saturated in X, Y, Z area. Right. Specifically, how would you address that for young people and young people specifically coming out of the service? Yeah, those darn buggy whip companies, darn it. <laughs> right? You, you know what I'm talking about? Was it, who was it, was it Benjamin Franklin? Somebody, like a very famous in, uh, inventor said, oh, everything that can be invented has been invented. Really? No. I think there's plenty of opportunity, but you're going to have to be innovative, right? Um, I think there's tons of opportunity. It's different. The opportunities moving forward are not going to be the same as they were five years ago. Things are moving so much faster. I wish I knew more about AI. I'd love to be in that space, you know, but I just don't know enough about it. And so I'm going to get eaten up by some robot, you know, one day. But um, no, I think there's tons. I, I don't. I, I think there's more opportunity. The more people there are on Earth, the more problems to be solved. Right? Aren't there? You know, who, who could have figured 20 years ago that Instagram would be around or Facebook, or maybe 30 years ago? Who'd have thought that? How many jobs has that created? Right? I'm not suggesting that we anybody go out and I've got to work, do the next Facebook. I think there's tons of opportunity, tons of it. I just disagree. That's all. I may be wrong. Oh, is that right? You know, I, I think you're amazing. Aww. And I think the advice that you imparted today was incredible. But I'm going to tell you a quick story. Hillary is an actress, and the theater group she was involved with was closed down for lack of money. And they had a show, a fabulous show named The Women. Those of us, oh, I saw the first round of it. It's in its, was in its third round with um, Annette Benning. And so what did they do? They took that show and they took it to a clothing boutique in, in um, Van Nuys. And the woman sold the clothes. They did the show in the boutique. They formed a partnership. And that's exactly what we were talking about. And to the lady with the equine business, Go find other places where people are riding horses, where they're right. doing those kinds of things, and get yourself some people that are really interested in putting in those hours. Yeah. My daughter would tell you, and I was like the top caterer in Los Angeles, you never made a meal for me, mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. Because the cobbler's kids have no that, shoes. That's right. right. <laughs> I didn't because I was busy building a business. You're right, Hillary. I never made a meal for you. Yeah, yeah. But, but I was out there. But, so exactly what you're saying is true. You need to go and put yourself where there are people training horses and are interested in yeah, that kind of right. subject. Yeah. And you will get a group around you of advisors that don't have 50 other things to do. Exactly. I had second and third jobs. I mean, I was, uh, uh, you know, typing papers for kids from yeah. UCLA and all of that. Yeah. I needed the money, but you did it at the time 
when it didn't interfere with promoting your business. Yeah, so maybe these people, we'll go back to you for a second, maybe those people who don't have time, maybe a better position for them is on a board of advisors. We have another question for you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Hello. Uh, Hi. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I want to just confirm that uh, inventing is still happening. Um, I'm an inventor uh, slash entrepreneur. I'm also a retired uh, veteran. Uh, did about 21 years in the Army. Um, what I like to say is that um, I'm an executive chef by profession, um, but I actually have a marketing invention uh, that I plan on putting out here shortly. Hopefully 2019 is going to be the year uh, that I break that ice. Um, it's going to take a lot of tenacity, a lot of focus, a good team. But I just wanted to uh, come around some people who had the same fire. Right? Uh, for me, because I have an invention, it's kind of hard because there's not like businesses I can focus on and look at what they're doing, my competition. Uh, the minute I put my product on uh, Google, I went to number one because there's nothing else there. I invented it. It's kind of cool because you pay a lot of money to be number one on Google. Yeah. I, you know? And my question is, right, for, for an inventor, a person that's, that's not even working in his profession, per se, I did uh, my, my marketing, uh, my degrees in marketing, uh -huh. um, but like I said, I'm a professional chef, that's what I do. Um, I actually have a, a, a marketing invention. Where do you go, I mean, when you're looking at um, liaisons, right? For my, in my case, I'm looking for licensors or licensees, uh, right? I, I'm sorry, I missed that last, where do I go to look for what? For, I want to look for uh, licensees with the, for this particular oh, marketing project, uh -huh. and quite frankly, I haven't found the right hub, or the right group, the right people. So I was hoping that you know either I'd find a contact or somebody would know. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you would know. And that was my question. Yeah, um, I don't know what the product is, so I can't help you uh, there. But you know what it is. I'd start going to events like this and, and talking to people. Um, I've seen it over and over again where people think that they've gotten a brilliant idea or an amazing invention, and yours absolutely maybe, but you don't know until people start seeing it, right? And even if, so I've got a couple of clients who are, who are inventors, and um, they are so prolific, and they just know that 95, 98% of them are gonna be duds. They think they're brilliant, but if people don't want them, don't sell people what you think they need, Nobody buys what they need. They buy what they want. So that's one thing that you got to figure out. What want does that fill? All right, so you sell them what they want. You give them what they need. Okay, this is a marketing ploy, okay? Um, and um, if anyone, I think what might help you, I did a, uh, a webinar several years ago for my coaching clients called Setting Out the Honey Pot. All right, so imagine you took a jar of honey and put it in your backyard. What's going to happen? A bunch of rodents, ants, all kinds of stuff is going to come to it, right? That's an easy way to collect rodents, ants, everything else. But if I said to you, I'm sorry, what's your name? Sal. Sal? Sal. 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 Go out and collect a bunch of ants, rodents, all that kind of stuff for me, and you're hunting around for them. What's easier? Put out the jar of honey or go hunt them down? You need to be that honey pot, all right? If you, did you sign up for this thing? Uh, I, I will add a bonus in there. I will give anybody who signed up for that thing this webinar called Setting Out the Honey Pot. And it talks, takes you step by step on how to get your name and brand out there so that people are attracted to you. It's a lot easier to drive revenue when people are coming to you instead of you going around knocking on doors. All right? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Good question, question. because I think that'll help everybody. Larry, we want to, first of all, thank you so much for your time thank and you. all your insights today. They thank were you. just absolutely awesome. Thank you. And on behalf of uh, Santa Barbara City College, the Jack and Julie Nadell School of Business and Entrepreneurship, the Scheinfeld Center for yeah. Business and Entrepreneurship, and on behalf of Dr. Beebe and all of the faculty and staff at this college, we want to thank you for coming uh, today and an appreciate honor. everything you've done. For thank us. you. It's an thank absolute you. honor. Love to do it again sometime. Well, Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. 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 Because what you have gotten is so much insight about entrepreneurship and how you can make things happen. But now, how do you take action? Right? We haven't gotten to that yet. And so that's what we want to. Um, do right now is to give you some next steps that will help you feel supported 
and develop, bring those ideas forth and hopefully build those businesses that you want. Um, there's a very important organization that is here that is instrumental in supporting veterans here at Santa Barbara City College and also at UCSB. And I would like to invite to the stage the co-founder of Pierre Kleisen's Veterans Foundation to tell it, Hazel uh, Blanken, Blankenship, yes, um, to, so that she can tell you a bit about how these organizations serve you. Hazel, please. I'm going to tell you just a little quick story to give you an idea how this, how these things start, uh, meaning nonprofits that are trying to help people, and especially veterans. Pierre Kleisson, for whom this vet Veterans Foundation is named, was five years old when World War I started. In 1918, he was 10 years old when the Germans were rousted. He remembered, until he passed in 2003, he remembered standing next to the, the main route to Antwerp as a 10-year-old, starving, having almost died num numerous times during World War I, the family having lost everything. And he saw the American doughboys marching in. And one of them broke rank and came out and handed him a sandwich. It was the first food that he'd had in 10 years, basically, that wasn't rotten or hadn't been taken out of a garbage can. He never, ever ever forgot that. And he came to the United States when he saw the winds of war blowing again in World War II. He'd become educated, become an architect, came to the United States, started all over again learning English. He volunteered to go into the United States service. He was a little old at that time. So they put him in khaki uniform and he became uh, one of the uh, foremost designers of the uh, Liberty ships, which carried most of the most of our wares abroad for World War II. He became a very successful architect, although not rich. He uh, lost two wives, both one to disease and one to a tragic accident. He remarried late in life, I mean, I would say late, um, in his 60s. And he happened to marry the widow of the heir to Standard Oil Fortune, Eileen Woods. Together they started a foundation, the Wood Plyson Foundation, which is in existence today. And of course, one of the things that Pierre most cared about were the veterans. And he came up with the motto, to be killed in war is not the worst, to be lost in war is not the worst, to be forgotten is the worst. So he started doing memorial services in honor of all veterans. When he passed away in 2003, my husband, who is a Vietnam veteran, Navy pilot, um, two tours in Cameron Bay, and I was in Vietnam for a few years too around that, that time. Uh, he came to my husband and said, I, I believe in what you're doing. He had started a small museum and my husband did a little bit of talking. Uh, he was a developer, he was not a, he was a historian by avocation. And uh, we had him over, we had Pierre over for a, a Normandy D-Day lunch where we had about 350 veterans, mostly from World War II. And Pierre came and he saw the lunch and he said to the both of us, he said, I want to see you on Monday, you come over on Monday. And by the way, he had started an, an annual ball at, that we carry on. And let's see, last, last week was our 22nd annual ball. So this was, as I said, about 2002. We went over for coffee and Pierre said to my husband, I believe in you, I believe in your mission. And he opened up his checkbook and everybody's gonna think now this make, made us rich, but <laughs> he opened up his checkbook and he wrote a personal check for a million dollars out to my husband. We didn't even have a 501c3 at the time. Now that money's long spent, so don't <laughs> count on that. But we've, worked, but we've been working adding to that since the, over the last 15 years. Wood Kleisen's Foundation is still in existence. It still helps us. But we were absolutely blessed about four years ago to have the uh, help of the Burnham Wood Country Club Golf Club has put on their annual golf tournament. This is the fourth year that they've done it. And the money that is received, which is very significant money, is siloed within the account of the Pierre Kleisen's Veterans Foundation to be used strictly to help 
veterans at UCSD and Santa Barbara City College with basically what we call unrestricted funds. You don't have to fill out applications. You have to be a veteran. You have to be pretty good standing. And we've got both schools are just blessed to have the two directors they have, both veterans themselves. Kobe is with UCSB and is new. We've got Kyle Rasmussen, Rasmussen, a Marine, forgive him for that, but he's been here a year and a half. And thanks very much to the leadership at City College because they had the foresight to take a look at the four-year successful program at UCSB and just say, okay, we're going to go with it. So that's what we do, and I just want to say welcome to all you veterans. We come to these things to sort of spread the word. When there is a need, when there's a need, when the GI Bill hasn't caught up with you or you need help with your academics or you need help with uh, this kind of a mission, then that's what the foundation is for. You go talk to the directors, and either one of these guys will check you out, vet you, make a phone call, and it's there. We had one young lady at City College with two kids. Her first day at school, her car was towed because she couldn't pay to have it smogged and the register met to the roof. So Kyle called, and that took about three days to it got solved. So that's the kind of thing we do, and we all just want to say thank you for your service and welcome home. Too often in life, especially how things are going these days, we learn, we seem to, to get the suggestion that our voice does not matter. Well, you know what? Your voice does matter, okay? What I would like to say is, uh, in closing, is thank you to all of you, and thank you so much to all of our speakers today. Can we give them all a hand? <laughs>